Welcome to the third webinar in Perpetual Storage's Cyber Protection Series on SMB's Biggest Cybersecurity Challenges. My name is Aubrey Murray, and I'm the EVP here at Perpetual Storage, and I'll be moderating today's discussion. As a reminder to our attendees, please keep your microphones on mute during the presentation, and if you have questions, please type them into the chat box, and we'll come back to that at the end. With me today are a panel of experts in the field of cybersecurity who are going to tackle the topic of the biggest challenges facing small to mid-sized businesses today, along with some tips on how to prepare for those challenges so your company and its data is protected. Before we get started, I'd like to introduce our panelists. Heather Stratford is the founder and CEO of Drip7. Drip7 is a game-changing cybersecurity awareness training platform, and it uses um, micro learning and gamification in order to train uh, companies, employees in a way that is quick, engaging, fun, and also while leading to long-term knowledge retention. Tara Anderson is a managing partner of Framework Security. And Framework Security is a cybersecurity consulting company that helps its clients by building full cybersecurity plans and provides ongoing guidance to eliminate vulnerabilities and to keep their companies protected. What also sets them apart is that Tara has a background in M&A finance funding, and that is not something you usually see with consultants. So she's uh, particularly positioned to help companies who need to look towards merger, future mergers and acquisitions and funding um, so that everything is smooth in those transitions. J.R. Maycock is CIO at Perpetual Storage. And Perpetual Storage is one of the most secure data storage and data center facilities in the world and provides peace of mind to its clients and their data, that their data will always be secure inside a mountain just outside of Salt Lake City, Utah. J.R. Maycock comes to PSI with a background in supply chain um, and warehouse management. And he was also the Veeam champion of Utah before he went over to the vendor side. So he understands that platform inside and out. And I am hard pressed to find other people that I meet to know more about cybersecurity that, than J.R. Maycock does. So for the benefit of the audience, we're going to organize today dis discussion into three high level objectives for small and mid-sized businesses to target, uh, like what to target when they look to improve their cybersecurity posture. And these objectives are human operations, systems, operations, and liability protection. Okay, so the first section we're gonna concentrate on is the human operations section. So Tara, how should we define this human operations objective? What makes it distinct? That's a great question. And in fact, that's my favorite question. So I'm so glad that you started this webinar with that. Um, I really love a campaign that CISA, CISA.gov is pushing right now. Um, they're pushing the culture of cyber readiness. And I've really attached myself to that because post COVID, well, we're in the middle of COVID still, like we keep saying post COVID, but truly we're still, we're still adapting to a pandemic. Um, we're still understanding what the fallouts are of the pandemic. But the biggest thing that I see in cultures right now is fear-based learning, high stress environments. Most companies are understaffed, employees are overworked. They're going fast, and there's a lot of fear out there about cybersecurity because we're finding out about new breaches almost every day in the news, um, small companies, large companies. Um, and there's just a lot to be afraid about. The economy, you know, is suffering right now. So as an employee, as a human being, you know, living during this time frame, we are more stressed than we've ever been. And now we're working from home. So there's a, a bigger... Uh, there's a bigger risk factor because we're working from home, we're working from coffee shops, we're working from airports, we're stressed, we're afraid. We're, some of us are getting hit with phishing campaigns and they're really punitive. There's a lot of fear base around, you know, the cybersecurity landscape right now. So what I'd like to do, what I'd like to see in every organization is more positivity and more information around cybersecurity awareness. Um, CEOs really need to know what to have, what they need to do if they're breached, their entire C-suite and board do. So if they're calm and collected and know what to do and test what they need to do, that rolls down to the employees. Onboarding is important. Employees, when they're onboarded, need to be given the tools uh, 
that they need to make informed decisions, how to recognize a phishing email, what happens if you get a phishing email, make it fun, you know, make it a, a part of their job, reward them for being a defender of an organization. Don't, don't penalize them for making mistakes. So create an environment that's open, honest, fun, and gamified. You can take cybersecurity and create a lot of knowledge around it, but not make it scary, not add more fear to someone's life or their role. Um, and also just really work on being prepared from the top level on down. What should happen if our good company you know, gets breached? Who does what? Be prepared, make it less scary, inform them and train them, keep current events kind of front and center, help them become more aware and educated of, of the risks out there. But most importantly, empower them to help you protect the organization. Don't see them as a risk. There's a lot of quotes out there about how employees are organization's biggest risk. Yes, employees do lead to up to 98% of all phishing and ransomware attacks. That's because they're not trained, they're not informed, and these attacks are very sophisticated. Empower them to be an asset, a defender, and a safeguard of your company's data. And I think those statistics will go way down. Yeah, so true, really. And I think that is a great segue to talk to Heather. So Heather, how important is it to train your employees in cybersecurity? And how often should you train employees? Well, I think anybody who's uh, on this particular uh, webinar is going to realize that cybersecurity is here to stay. We can't bury our heads in the sand and just say, oh, it's going to go away. It'll get better next year. It's not right. This is this is our new normal. And so we have to look at, well, what are we doing right and what can we improve? Some companies don't have any training and they need to start training. Right. Other companies might have started and they might do an annual training and they realize, well, I'm doing a little bit, but I need to push the envelope and move in the direction of more consistent, more training. And when I talk to people, I'll say it's not like we're asking you to train your employees an hour every day. Right. We're not asking that. What we are saying is it needs to be shorter. It needs to be a little more consistent. So if you're doing it none at all, uh, we want you to at least start. If you have an annual training, you need to move to a cadence of quarterly or monthly. If you're doing quarterly or monthly, you need to move to a cadence of maybe weekly or daily. And some of you are saying, you're rolling your eyes right now and you're saying, Daily, like what, where did that come from? Well, that's the type of programs and platforms that are out there now where you really can integrate with into the person's work flow. So it's not seen as a big burden or a big lift. You need to integrate it into your systems. Yeah, great answer. It's so true. And unless we're doing it all the time, it's like, how do we retain that information? So in the current environment, what would you say are the top three topics that should be covered in employee cybersecurity training? I would, uh, I would put phishing at the top. And uh, most people would do the same. Phishing is a, is a, is a big, broad topic. But it, it ties into things like, well, what, what are they phishing for? Well, they're phishing for passwords. What, uh, how are they phishing? They're phishing through social engineering. They're phishing by attacking with a ransomware attack. So all of these things definitely go together, but I would say phishing, uh, you need to talk about passwords and how to generate those passwords, uh, how to maybe use password managers. Um, there might be questions later on about LastPass. I mean, we obviously had a pretty big breach in the password management uh, area, but it's still all your employees need to understand how to create a good password and how to manage them. And then probably the last area is what I touched on is social engineering. How are, when you're on your social media and when you're putting information out there just in the wild, how can that be used against you and understanding how it all ties together? Great. Yeah, thanks so much. So what content needs to be included in employee training about social engineering? Well, that's a very complex area. Um, 
oftentimes I, I, and I am on some social media platforms myself personally. So I'm going to use myself as an example in terms of, hey, I'm a typical employee, right? Um, I'm a Gen Xer, right? So I'm not necessarily on TikTok, uh, although my kids want me to be on TikTok, but I am on other platforms. And there's uh, oftentimes a, uh, a quiz or, hey, fill this out. Um, how many, you know, they'll ask you questions about mascots and questions about when you, how long you've been married and all these kinds of things. And people respond. It's just amazing to me, all my friends from all over the country and the world who respond to these. And they're really uh, trying to get information out of you so they can attack. And what are they looking for? they're really looking for the keys to the kingdom. They're looking for passwords and how to get into a system. You might not think uh, if you are a front desk help or a janitor or um, just a regular salesperson, you might not think that your information is worth anything, but you are the vector, you are the entry point for them to get into a company. And then they'll move laterally, they'll move to accounting and they'll move to other places. So everybody is important and social engineering is out there everywhere. And we just have to educate on all employees, no matter what their generation is, what their role is. We need to educate them on what to look for and then empower them with that knowledge. Don't, like uh, Tara said, you know, don't be that fear-based, oh, don't do this, right? This is scary. We want to move it to the area that this is an empowering, we're giving you the tools, and we know that you can do this, because that's going to give you a much better uh, a culture within your company. For sure. And there's so many things I could go at right there. Um, but I think it's especially, I think that people need to know about TikTok. <laughs> and just also, like, as an example of an app you shouldn't be on, just because of the vulnerabilities that are inherent in just using that one app. And it's not the only one out there. There's lots of apps that'll do all this key logging and will record all this information that could be your credit card numbers and things like that. And people don't realize. So we have to be careful in so many ways and it's hard to know all of them. But um, if I can at least tell everyone out there, don't use TikTok, that's what I would say. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so switching speakers for a moment, um, JR. What content needs to be covered in employee training about creating and managing secure passwords? Yeah, I spent a lot of personal time and professional time thinking about this. The unfortunate truth is we can't get away from needing these secrets. Uh, the maturity of technologies is not ready to replace passwords all the way yet. It'll be a great day if we ever get there, but day-to-day, moment-to-moment, passwords or secrets that work in exactly the same functional way as passwords, even if they don't go by that title, are still around. They still dictate almost all the interaction basis and still dictate all the security horizon. Here's the few things you have to do. The number one rule is about not reusing a password anywhere. Every secret, every time you generate a piece of login information, it must be unique. That's part of why you need software assistance from something like a password manager to be able to succeed because human generation is not going to accomplish sufficient randomness. You need to additionally make sure uh, this is equally as important as ensuring random generation. You need to make sure that the password is not a known disclosed object. The working corpus of breached passwords that are available for uh, brute force searches, for rapid iteration through all of the known passwords that have ever been used in any data breach anywhere, is now approaching 1.3 billion entries or so. That's based on the work by groups of public security researchers who gather up those releases and corpuses and analyze them for matches and content and aggregate together what is or is not disclosed. Whatever mechanism you choose to use for generating your passwords, 
make sure it either itself includes the step of checking that generated object against the working corpus or do a manual check. The most famous of the public sites that lets you do one of those checks, a very well-designed site run by a security researcher named Troy Hunt, uh, goes at the web domain, have I been pwned? That is a search site where you can enter a string for a password and it will locally within only your browser compute a cryptographic hash and submit it against the check database of has this password been used before. Most good authentication systems automate that logic as well. Good password managers and uh, good identity managers. So say things like 1Password and Bitwarden and LastPass on the password manager side and identity management tools, things like Microsoft Azure Active Directory and Okta and Duo will help automate and take care of that process for the user right up front. Uh, but those are the grand rules in effect. Every single one needs to be unique. You must never reuse it anywhere and you must make sure that you are not accidentally reusing something that someone somewhere in the past used that's been disclosed. This is probably the moment as well to say uh, important concept that Heather alluded to. Password managers have taken a PR hit in the last three weeks. One of them in particular, LastPass. Their development environment was compromised and pieces of their source code were taken. The good news is they've been extremely transparent about the nature of that breach and their architecture is sufficient to guarantee password data is not at risk. Uh, their own corporate data is at risk and they may need to improve on certain other topics and areas we'll cover in today's conversation, uh, but it shouldn't degrade confidence that their product stack when appropriately used by a user and secured correctly through a strong master password and through multi-factor authentication, then we get the job done. And in on balance, you don't have any choice about interacting with passwords. So just taking the net analysis, summing it all down and skipping three or four hours of other excellent, highly intricate talk, uh, it is better to use a password manager every time. It's unquestionable that the benefits you get, that the level of security increase you get is worth the incremental risks of centralizing and managing and exposing data, however you want to think about it that way. Chair, I'm so glad that you addressed the last pass thing. And Heather, thanks for bringing it up for um, because JR knows this, when he first came to PSI, he saw that I was so paranoid that I was keeping a address book full of handwritten passwords for all of my different things, because I didn't want to put it, obviously didn't want to put it on a spreadsheet, <laughs> which people do. People put them on spreadsheets and save them to their computer. And it, even it's just not a good idea. And, uh, and I said, well, I don't know password managers, what if somebody got the keys to the password manager and they'd get the keys to my kingdom? And he said, that's not something to worry about. And uh, so I'm really glad that you addressed the last pass breach because um, I think it's on a lot of people's minds as to how secure their passwords are. And don't be like me and keep an address book full of uh, <laughs> passwords. <laughs> Well, um, I can say that's the second best approach. The physical book copy, if you really can't stomach the psychology of the password manager, physical book copy, unquestionably. Uh, last piece of advice I'd actually toss in here, though, it's worth noting. Something called a passphrase is the best case of how to generate a password as long as you're not facing a length constraint. Build a passphrase out of a uh, selection of words put together that in an emergency, if you had to skip auto-typing features and manually enter it, that is still sufficiently random. If you use a eight word passphrase, that is uh, especially generated by a method called diceware. That is much stronger than even something like a 12 character random password when it comes to its cryptographic resistance and much more interactive from the human point of view. That'd be the other thing I'd say is important as a takeaway. Lean on passphrases, as a better password. Great, thanks. Um, so JR, do you think you could elaborate further on your comment about ensuring passwords are not sufficient by themselves to cause a cybersecurity event? Yeah, yeah. Um, so that jumps into the multi-factor authentication topic. That jumps into making the combination of a system username and a declared login secret insufficient to grant access. 
that there must be other additional checks performed during the authentication flow before it's allowed to succeed. Uh, Multi-factor auth is, I don't know, it's gotten kind of a bad reputation from acceptance point of view or from uh, moment to moment opinion point of view. Some people see it or project it as an inconvenience. And I would love for today to count as an example of this is where your training program can succeed. This is where your reframing of the positivity of the strength of the participation and of the simplicity around how this kind of system can operate can really come to life. Training should emphasize and reward the use of additional factors beyond passwords and the encounter with those additional factors should be as positive as possible. Uh, it's all should be scoped in relationship to the sensitivity of the action being done. It's reasonable to make a stance that you can enforce MFA on all access. Uh, it's absolutely mandatory that you're going to enforce MFA on any remote access. So anything happening from a distance, uh, which includes all cloud-based software ever is always remote. So that should have MFA turned on every time without exception. And then every time you're using an administrative account, a highly powered account that can go make changes and go destroy data. That's where you definitely want it. The second factor that gets it added over the top of the password or third factors, depending on how you want to approach it. Uh, it's very important to make sure that that as much as possible is not text messaging. That's because SMS messages being sent to phone numbers are a low hanging fruit for someone to redirect by performing a uh, social engineering attack on the cell phone provider and transferring control of that phone number to one of their devices. The greatly preferred methods, you know, if SMS is what I call below the threshold of just don't use it, it's too much risk exposure. Greatly preferred are one-time password codes. So those get stored into authenticator apps, the root secret, the initial seed that helps the system and the user's app compare their codes. Six digit codes regenerated every 30 seconds. And that is then a additional authentication secret indicating not only do you have the password, but you have knowledge of a code stored on an authenticator app on a validated device. Better than that, you know, going up in preference order is authenticator apps that allow push prompts, that allow challenges in real time. Uh, Microsoft, for example, will display a two digit code on the authentication uh, attempt side and then have you enter that additional factor in a real-time challenge mode on the app side. Or the gold standard are FIDO hardware keys. Those are made by many companies, Google Titan and Yubico and uh, several other players in the space of positive we can provide resources and lists for attendees to consume in the live audience or in the future audience. And those are cryptographic secrets stored on hardware that are uh, very tightly tied to your direct ownership and presence of the secret in real time. Those are the closest we have to phishing resistant multi-factor auth. The other methods can still be phished with very, very sophisticated social engineering. The hardware keys are the closest we have to being truly powerfully in control. So yeah, that's, that's probably what I would identify as don't let passwords be enough, put MFA everywhere, it needs to be the new normal, and it isn't unpleasant. It can be faster than other off methods, and it can be the item that gets stressed in training is saying, this is your active participation. This is your contribution. This is the essence of how you prove you're an aligned team member, you're paying attention, and you're winning. Great. Thanks so much. So going back to Heather, uh, what would you say the metrics, uh, what are the metrics that are most important to measure in your training program? Uh, well, I, I love what JR just, just said, um, because the more that we hear it and understand it, then we're like, oh, that's why I have to do it that way. And that's really at the core of what your employees need to hear. They might have been told, hey, you need a lot, you know, you need an eight digit password, you need a 12 digit password. 
but they really don't understand what's behind it, right? Now we're all in cybersecurity here, so we are we we eat and breathe and 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 look at and read about this. But your regular employee, it's like cybersecurity. That's a scary topic. So in the past, for metrics, it's really been a checkbox, right? It's been okay. We have fifty employees. Have all fifty employees gone through and done a thirty-minute video or annual training? And HR will record that and they'll say, yes, we've trained. That's no longer sufficient. And many people have started to put in phishing uh, simulations. Now I've come out publicly uh, on the side that I, I don't love phishing simulations. I, I'm kind of against them because I see them as very punitive. But there are many organizations out there from government to private companies that have that standard set already. And, they, and so they run a phishing simulation on a quarterly basis, uh, on a monthly basis, and they push a fake email to their employees. Let's say it's, it's a FedEx, it's an Amazon, it's a, it's a template or it's a simple text one, different types of phishing. And the metrics that come from that are, did they click on it? I would like to help people think a little bit more about a better metrics. And that would be to look at, well, not just did they not click on it, but did they identify it and were they able to report it back to the IT team? Do they know who to report it to? Do they know where? Do they know how to get it there? Do they know what to do if they see something? Right. When we go through airports, they have this cliche message. If you see something, say something. Right. What we want is to create a culture within any organization, whether they're 25 people or 250, uh, you know, 25,000 people. We want to make sure that everybody is aware of, hey, this doesn't look right and know who to respond to. So the metrics that I use on any campaign is more about who's reported. And that's a much longer process and it, it requires training. But once again, let's, let's look at a different type of risk, uh, like fire. Uh, we, we train people on how to exit a building and what, what, what should they do? Um, if they saw something, would they know who in the company they would report it to, to say, hey, this is a problem. Same thing with IT. Do they know who to talk to and how, and making that pathway simple? I know a lot of employees have a fear of reporting something because they're like, well, what happens if it isn't a fish? Will I get in trouble, right? Will, I, will, will it come back on me? And what we want to do is create a culture that's open and that they can say, doesn't matter if you know it's a fish or not. If you think so, we want to see it and have that open communication of how to. So I would, I would really say the metrics that are most important is not just the frequency of your training, but whether people are, are reporting. I say, I do it in three simple words. Are you training? Are you securing? And are you engaging your employees? And these are the ways that you can help them move in the right direction. I think that's so great. And I think that what really ties into that is the idea of having processes around cybersecurity that the employees know about. And I, I think that's definitely part of the cybersecurity training. But again, it goes to, well, what happens if they find something that's fishy? Mm -hmm. What do they do next? And um, and yeah, that's that's so important. So yes, going going back to what you're saying. Thanks so much. Um, okay, so Heather, if you don't have a cybersecurity training program started being an SMB. Uh, what are the top three things that an SMB can do to begin? Well, I think that many small businesses use third party uh, people to help, whether it's an MSP, a managed service provider, or an MSSP, a managed uh, service security provider they use a third party to help. If you have engaged with a third party, talk to them 
and say, hey, we'd love to set up a program. Hey, what do you have for us, right? Open that door and ask them what they have to, to give to you. Now, many people who might be on this call and listening, they don't have that third party yet. And they're trying to do it in-house, uh, inexpensively, uh, add it to somebody's uh, workload, um, somebody in IT, preferably. Uh, I once ran a multinational program with a very large company uh, through different uh, through different countries. And I got one guy on the phone and he goes, look, I don't want to be doing this. And I said, well, what is your job role? And he said, I'm the fire master. He said, if the computer's on fire, I know how to put it out. And I said, okay, I get it. And we really held his hand through it. So assigning it to the right person is helpful, right? You can't just assign it to anybody like the fire master. He said, I don't even know how to turn that thing on. Uh, <laughs> he, uh, he was being honest, right? So give it to the right person. Um, if you're a small business, you also want to make sure that you get leadership behind the program. There are so many things that we want to push out in an organization and we start and then it fizzles out because there's not a dedicated person or it's not in somebody's job role and leadership hasn't supported it. If you don't have leadership on board, if people can't see that this is important to leadership, they will not pay attention to it. So some of the ways that you can engage leadership is to take a short video. One minute of the CEO saying, this is a priority for us. I want everybody have leadership take little videos saying, I thought my password that was, and even show an old password, this is my old password. I learned that this is wrong. I changed. Like really being human about it and showing that leadership is on board will help everybody below that level say, oh, I need to wake up and take this more seriously. And then the last thing is that continual communication. If you roll something out, make sure there's a, a continuity in what you give to people. And if you're running a year program, say, we're going to run a year program. We're going to touch base. We're going to track and do the uh, metrics so that people can see it's not just a one time, oh, they talked about it once in a big meeting and I never heard anything above it again. Yeah. I think that uh, one of the things that's key is knowing how to bring it up to the leadership because I think a lot of times people think if they, if they just phrase it in the way where they say, well, it's important because it's important to me that that will translate to leadership as being important. When I think that really, when you think about having that conversation with leadership, you've got to talk about it in the way that it affects the bottom line. Um, oh, absolutely. I'm glad you brought that up because when you talk to leadership, if you're going to find budget or you're going to say, hey, I need additional resources. Looking at the ROI or return on investment is very important. Looking at how is this going to reduce our risk, including your legal team, who is often saying, what do you mean we don't have any documentation? What do you mean we can't fill out our cybersecurity insurance policy because we don't have these things in place, right? So helping tie together both the legal and the complex uh, management side of it, as well as we're reducing risk. And when we train better, then we also can save money and showing how that happens, right? Yeah. Oh, they're always happy to hear about how to save money. Right. So, um, so going along with that, so Heather, what amount of budget should a business allocate to address this objective? Well, I would probably say start someplace, right? Some companies don't have anything set aside. And so if you have zero in your budget right now, you need to add something. But if I were to take a small business that's, uh, you know, 25 people, 30, maybe 50 people, you can start a program for under $10,000, right? Uh, you could probably start a program for $5,000. And what would be in that? 
I would have a platform uh, that does some of the education. I would do some rewards within that so that people say, oh, I could get a free Starbucks card or I could get uh, a parking spot up front or just the kudos, but having a little bit of, of uh, incentive for people to move in the right direction. Then you might also have lunch and learns, or you might say, hey, we're gonna bring in pizza into a break room if you're not all remote and people can come and eat and hear something. So all together, um, if you're a small business, you can do this for a reasonable amount of money, 400 to $500 if you're doing it internally per month. If you're um, using an MSP to help you, uh, they will have a line item probably that they can add in there and they will do that heavy lifting for you. And that will range uh, depending on what the services that they provide to you. And it will probably be on a monthly basis as well. Yeah, and what I wanna say about what I really like about your program, and I'm gonna do a plug for you, um, just because I believe in what you guys have so much is that you already have cybersecurity training in place, but you can customize it to any kind of business and depending on the kind of compliance. So and that's another thing that I really like about what you guys do in particular with the training. So thanks so much. Thank you. Well, I appreciate that. And there's a lot of options out there. And I used to put together really large national and international programs using all the platforms. And the reason that I pivoted myself and started a new company was because the resources just weren't good enough. So there yeah. are new platforms out there that uh, I think small businesses would be surprised and say, oh, this is what I've been looking for. So go looking, mm -hmm. uh, look at us, look at others, and um, you'll be surprised to find something that's very easy to roll out and doesn't break the bank, right? That for a small amount of money each month, you can really move your cybersecurity in the right direction. Mm -hmm. um, when it comes to the people side or the uh, the human side, which is uh, the the one that you can have a lot of impact on. Great, thank you. Okay, before we move to our next section, which is going to be on system operations, I just want to remind everybody that if you have questions, we will um, address them at the end. So type them into the chat um, as you have them, and we'll make sure to come back to them. So system operations. So I'm going to go back to you, Tara. So how should we define this system operations objective and what makes it distinct? Sure. Um, I think it's it's critical now more than ever. Um, post work from home era, the 2020, you know, March 2020, we all went home, right? We worked in offices. We had computers that were typically provided by our employer. We had physical security. We had cybersecurity typically in place, um, policies, procedures, and then everything became really fluid. So we went home and our kids were doing school from home and they were typically on our laptops that sometimes we did work on too and vice versa. So a, a lot changed a couple of years ago. Um, work Because work became really fluid and people were working from home and on their own devices, kids working on professional devices and vice versa, um, we obviously increased our risk for cybersecurity uh, exposure. Um, what I'd like to take a second to do is say, not only is that a cultural risk by working from home and working, you know, bringing your personal life into your professional life, your professional life into your personal life, blurring the lines can, you know, lead to a tremendous amount of overwhelm, overwhelm decrease culture and lead to more risk. But also businesses can't protect what they don't know exists. So if if you're running on your own personal device, they can't monitor it, um, maintain it. So they can't do regular recommended patches. So if there's a known exploit, patching isn't happening and updates aren't happening automatically. Um, they don't know what sites you're exploring, what you could potentially be opening them to. Um, they don't have the ability to lock things down to evoke email security and endpoint protection. Um, you could be vulnerable if you're if you're working from a coffee shop or an airport or even a condo. Um, somebody can get in <laughs> to your network that way. Um, so there's many things that have happened. Um, 
COVID, uh, that COVID kind of spurred along. But basic recommendations here are church and state. Um, your company does need to provide your employees with, with devices. Um, I recommend it mobile as well. But if we just start with just computers and operating systems, um, by providing your employees their computers, you're able to put remote monitoring tools on it. You're able to restrict access to certain websites. You're even able to restrict uh, access from other high-risk companies from viewing your own website. Um, you're able to really oversee that use and protect it. Um, that eliminates shadow IT. So your employee coming in and putting uh, software, hardware onto the device that that may also increase your vulnerability. So I guess the first rule of thumb is, is church and state. Um, use work only for work. Um, if you can avoid utilizing your personal cell phone, do that. That's just another attack factor that opens you up for more smishing and social engineering campaigns, more texts that you can click on saying a package is going to be shipped. I don't know about anyone else. I suspect many people give their kids their phones to play games. You know, kids like, hey, mom, your package is at the door. They click on a link or they access sites um, that daisy chains into your work environment. So keep things separately. Um, and, and then, you know, we're going to move a little bit forward to then what do we do as a company um, when we provide these devices? Uh, what are some good best practices? One is to come up with a privilege access management policy and maybe a tool. Um, HR and finance are two separate departments. Typically, the HR team doesn't need the same information that finance team needs and vice versa. So it's restricting access to a need to know basis and only allowing certain users certain amount of access and typically not allowing even one user all the access. So, um, you know, there are, are tools even like Protegrity, which is, a, is, which is in Salt Lake City. They have a great solution for giving certain teams and departments of special access, restricted access, need to know basis. Um, you can absolutely you know, put policies into place this way. Um, SANS.org has templated policies. We recommend that they're customized to your organization and that you have an outside party that specializes in cybersecurity do that. But if budget's an issue, go on the SANS.org, make policies and procedures, use policies, um, create an inventory of your equipment. It goes back to you can't protect what you don't have. So you need to know what devices you have in your organization, the servers, the fax machines if you have them still, devices that are used maybe for point of sale only or are assigned to an employee. You just need to know what you have and then you need to keep logs. So some of those things are some crossover. Um, those are required for insurance policies, which I know we're getting into later down the road, but they're just good basic cybersecurity hygiene best practices. So if I were to give you again any advice, separation, keep track of what you have. So do inventory, do logs, update regularly. So set yourself up for automatic rate updates, have a team ideally that goes on patch Tuesday and does any manual patching. Um, and none of that can happen if employees are using their personal devices. So do that. Try to, you know, give them company divided devices like cell phones um, that will you know, reduce the attack vector as well. Um, last recommendation would be mobile device management like like Jamf. If a phone's lost or stolen or in the hands of, say, um, an insider risk, you can you know, lock down and encrypt the phone as well. Um, that's incredibly important, especially as JR talked in, in excess about uh, multi-factor authentication and, and Authy. A lot of those codes are sent to mobile devices and phones. So if phones gone and missing and in the wrong hands, you need to have the ability to lock that down. Yeah. Um, Did I answer your question? Okay. Yeah. No, that, I think okay. you did a great job doing that. Thanks. Thanks. You're welcome. You're <laughs> welcome. I know there's a lot to still cover still. Yeah, there's, there's a lot, but there's always more in cybersecurity. It never kind of ends, does it? Um, so JR, what does a small business need to do to ensure this boundary exists around their systems? And that boundary being the uh, where the business starts and stops. Hmm. Uh, the definitional starting point is exactly as Tara laid out, having a uh, either device-based or if you're taking a more complex approach logical separation-based distinction between where the business is and where the business isn't. Uh, 
anything that is inside the relevant boundary of being part of the business is there because it has access to data or access to applications that form the business. That's the distinguishing fact. Does business data live on this device or is accessed on this device? Then it needs management. So that's the explicit step of establishing the boundary. You have to enforce policy controls using technical systems, not just faith of how people can behave. And you need to enforce the minimum safety level through software updates, patches on web browsers, correct use of infrastructure for all of the assets that form the business at that boundary. Um, and it really, really helps to keep a map, to keep an itemized active inventory of what all the systems are, what all the applications are, and what the relevance is to the different departments of your business, the different objectives that you have to do. Don't let that just exist in someone's brain. Make sure it's written down and make sure that is something you go and refer to anytime you're creating a net new function, new bullet point, new item in the documentation. Yes, definitely don't rely on hopes and dreams of what you wish your employees would or wouldn't do, right? <laughs> Big time. I mean, we have to, I think, be a little skeptical when it comes to our businesses and kind of plan for the worst. And my, I mean, I, I always kind of think that way myself. So yeah, thanks, JR. Um, okay, so JR, again, going back to this, what are the most important basics to address system operations actions that are consistently relevant to every business, no matter how small or what in industry they operate in? Tara nailed very important pieces of this list. So we don't need to repeat them other than their choice title. Uh, Role-based access control to separate privilege by job role, guaranteed. Uh, having the ability to use an identity for each person, never sharing an identity. Everybody is one account and only one account. There is no front desk. There is no uh, customer service, that kind of username that's shared across people. Uh, opportunities for that to at all coexist with safety have ended. Everybody needs to be one individual. Um, the separation of device roles, the enforcement of policies around access, those are all critical. Uh, the pieces I would add here are explicit separation of admin accounts from productivity accounts. You must have a different username entirely for a privileged account that can go make changes. I think it's also very important to make sure that the moment you're taking on a new piece of equipment, computer, network equipment, or taking on a new system, new hosted software, software as a service application out there on someone else's computer. Don't accept any default configurations or default passwords. Reset them all. Uh, those default strings are one of the lowest hanging vulnerabilities, and you need to go the day you are onboarding something, correctly customize its identity information to your company and your company alone. Last two I'd toss in here, because I want to Keep it short. You know, we're not going to ask people to absorb language from here that renders them direct IT experts, rather just know that these are the concepts that matter. These affect the business operations. Last two would be, you need to have a really excellent process for onboarding and offboarding employees to make sure you have that boundary intact of who is inside the business versus who is outside the business. And the second part of that, when someone is leaving the business, needs to be something you can keep tight in time. You need to have that be possible to do within a couple hours in case there is act promoting or negative circumstances around someone's departure. And I think the other thing that can sneak up on folks, one that not a lot of people think of because this begins to use quite technical language is DNS, the domain name system, and the way that people get to you using a string that looks like a website or an email to me. DNS is the root of identity because email is the root of identity. That's where every reset goes. That's where every new account registration goes. If you don't have DNS under incredibly tight and perfect control and used to enhance your security operations, it will be used against you and it will render almost all the rest of your preparations irrelevant in an instant. 
Yeah, for sure. Thank you so much. I know that we're trying to get through all the content here. Um, so we'll, we'll keep going. But when it comes to the amount of budget that a business should allocate uh, to address this objective, what do you think that budget should be? Well, the good news is almost all the content we've talked about in this section is down to rules and down to policy enactment. Those aren't tools that directly have costs. Those are instead the correct use of tools you're already paying for. So a whole lot of system security objectives uh, start just with the correct use of the systems, not added costs to get there. You have to get across that minimum boundary defining threshold where there are devices owned by the business if people are using full state computers or you are using correct mobile device management on shared assets to keep tight containers around work content on personally owned devices. Implementing that set of actions can come with a hardware cost up front. For a lot of small businesses, the ongoing management is much smarter to delegate through engagement to additional parties. It's something Heather alluded to in the previous variant of this question. Having managed service providers give you fractional staff access instead of assuming full-time employee direct to the company can be very efficient here. And when it comes down to the real dollars needed, I think it's perfectly rational to suggest that on a per employee headcount, somewhere between about $50 to $100 a month gets you across the threshold of the minimum core stuff necessary. That's an example of something like the security and content licenses from Microsoft 365 that can accomplish a huge number of these objectives all at once. Or it's the additional layers for uh, password management pieces. So there's some ongoing management costs you can look at for a third party or an internal employee, and there's software costs that you need to have assigned to your employees. Thanks so much. Okay, so we're gonna move on to the liability protection section. So Tara, this is to you. So how should we define this liability protection objective? What makes it distinct? I think what makes it distinct is um, that insurance is, is evolving, but probably not quickly enough to, to meet the demands of the cybersecurity landscape. Uh, so pre-2020, if a company was willing to pay for cybersecurity insurance, you would get it. <laughs> so if you're if you're able to write a check for, for liability, cybersecurity liability insurance, you would get it. There's very little, uh, there's very little approval process, very little that goes into underwriting. Um, and and also it was common for companies to think that they were protected because there's a line item on their general um, business writer. So you have a general business umbrella. There'd be a, a line item for small for cybersecurity insurance, which which generally protected very little. Um, and most companies at that time thought they were covering covered. So cybersecurity insurance has evolved, um, but there's some still there's still some nuances that you want to be aware of. Um, one is it's harder to get. Um, two, the coverages really aren't adapting as quickly as they need to for today's risks. Um, an example of that would be war crime. So if you know, cyber, we're in, a, in the middle of a cyber war right now, as many of you are aware, it, most insurance brokerages and companies don't cover acts of warfare. So if you are attacked by uh, a nation state, regardless of if you can prove it or not, typically that's not covered, which is very common right now. Um, you know, nation states do want access to our IP, to our critical infrastructure, to our trade secrets. Uh, they they want to take down our, com com our country as a rule. So that's not covered. Um, errors and omissions. Um, some companies are covering cybersecurity losses under ENO insurance. Some are not. So you're going to want to know the nuances there if there's coverages or not. And find one that ENO does actually cover interruption due to cybersecurity breaches. Um, it's harder to qualify for. So let's talk about that briefly because I know that uh, most of you, because you're here, you care passionately about an SMB. Maybe you're a founder, a CEO, an entrepreneur. Um, so what can you do to qualify for cybersecurity insurance and keep premiums low? Um, first thing you can do is, is get a cybersecurity risk assessment. Um, we like the SIS 18 because it's more modernized. It came out about a year and a half ago, post-COVID. It addresses remote work. 
Um, we like that. We recognize that there are other frameworks out there that we use a lot that certain industries do require. We like that because an outside party comes in and looks at your risks and vulnerabilities uh, objectively without bias. Um, this could be done in house as well. It could be done, you know, low cost, assign someone to look at it. Um, but, you know, a third party assessment typically provides a letter of attestation to an insurance provider. Um, if you find yourself in litigation in a lawsuit down the road, that letter of attestation and assessment could go a long way as drawing a line in the sand. But just do one, you know, have somebody preferably on your team in IT that has background and a desire to do it, not the fire putter outer, I think you call them. Um, get that done, draw a line in the sand, see where you're vulnerable. And it will go over many different things, such as how you're, how you're storing data, what you're storing, how you're storing it, if you're having backups completed. We recommend the three to one rule, three different types of backups, two different media, one completely separated air gapped and offsite. Um, so they're going to want to know if you're backing up your data. They're going to want to know if you're keeping logs. This goes back to assigning uh, employees devices. Are you maintaining those devices with regular updates and patching? Um, do you have remote monitoring tools on your devices? Do you have proper onboarding and offboarding? You know, like JR talked about, when employees are onboarded, are they getting training immediately? You know, so they need to be trained the minute they are assigned devices to train cybersecurity awareness based off their user role. If they're developers, they need developer secure training, typically aligned to OWASP. So we will go through that. Any outside provider would do that. Any assessment would go through that, even internally. Um, so again, the important things here would be company provided devices, if you're keeping an inventory, your onboarding and offboarding procedures, policies and procedures, pull them off of SAMS.org, get them going. What do you do if you're breached? What's your instant response plan look like? And test that, you know, do a tabletop exercise. So put the policies down, retest, re, you know, do them as often as needed. If there's a high profile position that exits the company, you're gonna to have to redo your, your incident response plan, your policies and procedures according. So essentially in summary, get an assessment, start understanding where you're weak and where you're strong, get that letter of attestation, go get cyber insurance um, before you can no longer get it. Um, get it while your cy cybersecurity hygiene is good and controlled um, and then keep maintaining those policies and procedures. Um, those are the, the very, very basics. Again, I just had very little time. So if you're wanting to connect with me over LinkedIn, I'll give you a list. Um, I, I'm not giving my, my email because that is, that sets me up for another attack vector by putting my email out there, but it, to connect with me. I'll give you further instructions and summarize bullet list. Um, but get the insurance. If you can get a cybersecurity uh, attorney, you know, on retainer, go interview a few, just so you know who to call in in, in the event that you're breached, um, and then just have a plan in place. Be well informed, keep testing. Um, but I can't tell you enough how important cybersecurity insurance is right now. Um, it's not perfect; doesn't protect everything, but it's going to help you. You know, in the event that you have significant amount of downtime, um, you're going to have to hire someone to do breach response and notifications. You're going to have to do investigations. You'll probably find yourself in a, in a class action lawsuit if employee data is compromised and you've, and you've been negligent. So be careful. PCI fines, if you're collecting PCI information, PII fines, PHI fines, insurance will help with, with a good amount of that. So go, so go get it. If you have questions on how to do that, let me know. Thank you so much, Heather, Tara, and JR for your thoughtful insight into the cybersecurity challenges that SMBs are facing today. I'm now going to put a slide up with contact information for all of the panelists today so attendees can reach out if they'd like to ask questions privately. Now I will take the rest of the time we have left to read some of the questions we have from the attendees. So I, I do think that you went through a lot of the questions um, that we had here for insurance, but um, you know, like what should a small business do today to be, begin protecting yourselves? I feel like you covered that already. Um, unless there's anything else you want to add to that, Tara? Um, yeah, I, I could. If I could slow, yeah, slow it down a little bit and, and stress onboarding and offboarding. Training. Training is low cost. Heather went through the costs of you know, large organizations, small organizations. You could do it in-house. Um, there's, there's resources out there. Um, assign someone to your cybersecurity program. It could be honestly just a passionate individual. 
Um, who cares? You know, there's a lot of resources out there. CISA.gov, CISA.gov, SANS.org, CA, or sorry, SANS.org. Um, the privacy site is great too, the IAPP.org. Um, IAPP, we didn't talk about this, so we plan to, will help you with the risk calculator. So if you were to go to IAPP, there's three or four different types of risk calculators, and you can put in there what type of data you're storing, how many records you have um, that you're keeping, if it's cons consumer data, company data, employee data, or a combination. Um, it'll ask you questions like if you have cybersecurity insurance, um, and then it will calculate the cost of a breach for you. It'll look at average downtimes, um, basically the cost per record. Um, and it's based off of you know, the complexity of your environment to remediate from a breach, the, the negative impact in the media, um, and that can vary greatly. Um, as many of you probably have heard, Holiday Inn what has been breached as of yesterday. Um, large global hotel chain. Um, I like to compare this to a more localized chain in the Northwest, one that I'm really, really fond of uh, called McMenamins. They're family owned. They have 62 locations. They're a hotelier as well. They also have little theaters. Um, they're smaller in scale, but the impact to them was great. So I, I like to look at those different case studies. Um, you've got a small hotelier, family owned, more regional versus a large global chain, but the impact can be seen as greater to the small chain because um, they they rec they rely more there on their brand and their rep reputation. Holiday Inn, you know, they're going to put money at fixing their brand, warm and fuzzy commercials, doing some promotions. You know, they're going to get their likeness back up there again relatively quickly because they might have money to throw at it. A smaller, more more intimate brand doesn't always have those resources. So the cost of the breach can can sometimes be more for a smaller brand in an SMB than a larger one. Um, this particular hotelier, McMenamins, they were down for three weeks. Um, and if you can imagine across 60 plus locations, they can't take hotel reservations. They can't check you out for dinner. You can't go to their movie theater. Everything is manually processed. You have to hire more staff. Um, so the costs are about the same to remediate. Downtime is typically longer, but across the board, the average downtime is three weeks. So you need to look at how you're going to be able to make it. If you have to go down and you cannot collect revenue for one day, how much that will cost you? And then, you know, multiply that by the average of 20 days. Um, but look at other things like fines. And if you find yourself in lawsuits, Big Men and Mids, again, the small chain, they also found their, themselves in a class action lawsuit from former employees. So if former employees pulled together and said, you were negligent with my data. You did not protect it by putting basic cybersecurity pra practices in place. Um, P.S. This hurts me a lot because I really enjoy this chain and I love small businesses, but the employees didn't feel like they are being well protected. And that's a cultural thing. And so that goes back to culture and making them feel valuable and expressing that you're doing all you can to protect their data and customer data. Um, I think it's it's just as important for your employees to know that you care because good companies that do everything that they can still get compromised, they still get breached and hacked. So um, yeah. kind of just keep that in mind that smaller companies, they tend to think that they're under the radar, that the holiday ends are, are the target. Everyone is the target, but the smaller companies do tend to pay to pay more per per record that has been exposed. So yeah, so and I, found I that a little bit. You had some great advice there about the risk calculator because I think that the cost of a breach is different depending yes. on the kind of company that um, exists and what kind of data gets breached and things mm -hmm. like that. So it is different depending on what business you're talking about. Right, um, and I'll, I'll put those sites um, in the chat so you can look at those. Um, those calculators specifically are really helpful. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I think that what would be really good to address is what what does cyber liability insurance cover? I think you talked about a little bit about, and it really stood out to me that um, breaches that come about because a nation state goes after you are mm -hmm. not going to be covered, but what kinds of costs would be covered and why would it be valuable to have cyber insurance? I know I'm kind of going off script, but I kind of feel like this <laughs> encaps encapsulates a lot of the questions that a small, medium-sized business might have. 
Absolutely. And I touched on them really fast again. So to, you know, to take it down a notch, um, it's going to be um, privacy compliance. Um, so if you're, if you have one customer in a state that has privacy mandates, mandates such as California and New York, there's 13 different states, um, GDPR, if you're selling into European Union, um, you're going to potentially be liable for, for privacy issues, privacy fines. Um, so that's something that cybersecurity protect, liability protection is covering right now, business interruption. So if it's network business interruption, um, you, you get some percentages. I mean, again, it depends on coverages because there's limits. So there, uh, you know, if you're down for three weeks, you could get a fair amount of that time paid for. Again, depends on your coverage, likely not all of it. So business interruption is typically covered. Um, breach notifications. So that's the process of notifying customers of, of the potential of a breach or a breach. Um, typically that's a third party that comes in to see what information was compromised and who needs to be notified. Um, that can include credit report monitoring as well. So if you extend credit report monitoring to employees, customers, um, that can be covered. Um, Remediation. So if you're going through and getting digital forensics done, you want to know if you're compromised or breached. Is that attacker still in my network? <laughs> How did they get in? Where are they at? What did they have access to? And typically that takes a third party doing digital forensics to uh, to recognize. And, and there's a cost to that. If it's deemed that you need a new firewall, if you need VPN, if you need employee devices, the remediation work just takes money. Increased technologies. Um, privilege access management, whatever the remediation steps are, um, typically will cover a portion of that. Um, but the, it could also mean e, e and O at times. So if you're a company that can no longer fulfill on a contract, you can be protected. It goes down to limits, though. If you know if you're if you're you know, not doing business for three weeks to a month, if you have negligent cybersecurity practices, if that isn't covered. It, it may not be covered. Um, if you, so if you're basically not doing the steps that you said you were doing, um, there's a lot of reasons for insurance companies to say, no, I'm sorry, you did not take the steps that you agreed to take to protect this data. So it's mm -hmm. critical that you take the steps um, and, and, and be a good steward of all data. Um, so I would just say to get that assessment done, know where you're weak and where you're strong, prioritize that. Um, biggest priorities being on getting penetration testing done to see where you could be exploited and how. Um, mm -hmm. Close those gaps and, and get employees on devices that you can monitor and patch um, policies, get those going, and training. Um, I think those would be the biggest things to start right away. VPNs are critical if you have any remote workers. Um, I'm sure there's something I'm forgetting. There's a lot of great lists out there. Um, to contact an insurance agent, and they'll they'll tell you what to do, but get it um, because it will it will minimize the the financial output from your organization, get you back and up and running a lot sooner. Yeah, and and I would say I'm actually going to stop this section a little early because we are going to go into it, and our next webinar is going to be specifically about cyber insurance, so we'll be able to go okay. into more depth on it. Um, but the one thing I will say to people who are listening now that make sure that you get a insurance person that understands, understands what they're talking about, because most insurance agents are not going to understand the ins and outs of cyber liability insurance. They're just not going to understand the technology behind it. They're not going to understand the language. They're not, they're not going to mm -hmm. understand the ramifications or know where the holes are if you have lots of policies together. Um, and so if you need help with that, I think anybody, you could reach out to anybody on this um, panel and we could recommend you to uh, agents that we know that actually specialize in this because otherwise it's the blind leading the blind and you really just don't wanna go there. So um, thank you so much. You gave us a lot of really great insight there, Tara on, um, on that, um, on, we had one question from Jen Dennis Johnson that we didn't cover, and unfortunately he left already, but his mm -hmm. question was, is there going to be any discussion about types of software protection? So real quick, um, how about JR, we'll start with you. You wanna talk about software protection? 
Sure. And the good news is Dennis has indicated he wants to use the contact information we're going to publish to follow up time with me if he needs any extra clarifications. The software that has to be in place for protection uh, does still need to feature some manner of endpoint protection on the user side devices. Uh, but the more advanced cybersecurity operations that we're implying here, if you're going through and enacting all the sections that we have described where employees are trained and where system operations are under proper technical controls, the software tools are no longer uh, often a matter of what is running on any given device. The tools are instead the policy engines, the central platforms and the cloud management platforms that dictate your security outcomes across a whole fleet. You set systems of intent up and systems of alert up. Those do the job for you that block data exfiltration, that monitor for the incorrect use of credentials, that monitor for any kind of adverse event. Uh, so where 10 years ago, that question could be answered with a set of vendors that needed to be coexisting with each other inside of the system that's saying these are the best of breed software pieces. It's now much more abstracted into platforms instead of software is what I'd honestly say is the, the right answer. Okay. Um, Tara, Heather, anything else to add? Um, I think it's a pretty deep topic and it probably deserves its own, its own session. Um, but, uh, it's, uh, it's an important topic to cover. I agree. I think it could definitely have its own topic and that's all the time we have. Thank you to our esteemed panelists and to our attendees for making this a great and informative event. Please join us for our next webinar in our cyber protection series on Thursday, October 13th at 10 AM mountain time as we discuss recent changes to cyber liability insurance policies and how those changes impact protection for businesses and other organizations. Until next time, stay safe out there.